Time magazine called him the unsung hero behind the internet. CNN called him a father of the internet. President Bill Clinton called him one of the great minds of the information age. He has been voted history's greatest scientist of African descent. He is Philip M. Iguali. He's coming to Trinidad and Tobago to launch the 2008 Kwame Ture Lecture Series on Sunday, June 8th at the JFK Auditorium, Uwe St. Augustine, 5 p.m. The Emancipation Support Committee invites you to come and hear this inspirational mind adjust the theme, crossing new frontiers to conquer today's challenges. This lecture is one you cannot afford to miss. Admission is free, so be there on Sunday, June 8, 5 p.m. at the JFK Auditorium, New East St. Augustine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Philip M. Aguale. The history of civilization is the history of technology. Fire is man's first invention, or rather, man's first discovery. Who domesticated the first chicken? Who domesticated the first goat? Who rode the first horse? The names of ancient scientific pioneers are lost in the midst of time. Who solved the first quadratic equation? Who programmed the first ensemble of processors that led to the invention of the modern supercomputer that computes in parallel? The computer is the quintessential human invention. The supercomputer is the intellectual workhorse of mathematics and physics of mathematicians and physicists parallel processing is the vital technology that enabled the supercomputer to tower over the computer fast computation is what defines the computer the fastest computation is the only objective and measurable contribution to the development of the computer. Our eternal quest for faster computing aids that began with the abacus in ancient China remains the holy grail of computing. Yet, that quest had only one paradigm shift of a tectonic scale namely parallel processing or computing many things at once instead of computing only one thing at a time. Parallel processing is the enabling technological knowledge that makes modern computers faster as well as makes the new supercomputer the fastest. Searching for the parallel processed solution to the toughest problem arising in calculus and physics was like searching for a black goat at night. My journey to the farthest frontier of technological knowledge and my quest for the fastest supercomputer that is a new internet was a mathematical journey from fiction to fact, to fact, to forecast. The fastest supercomputer is where humanity's future takes shape. I'm Philip M. Aguale. In my family, I traveled the farthest when I left Asaba, Nigeria, for the bus station in Onicha, Nigeria, on early Saturday morning of March 23, 1974. At 9 o'clock that morning, I boarded the red and white painted luxury bus called Midwest Line and traveled for nearly 48 hours from Onicha to Benin City. At Benin City, I became impatient that the Midwest Line bus was too slow at merely 60 miles per hour. I was afraid that I might miss my flight to the United States. For that reason, I transferred to a four-door Mercedes-Benz car, 
a taxi that was also operated by the Midwest Line. That was the most dangerous car ride of my life. The taxi driver floored the pedal to speeds of nearly 120 miles per hour. The taxi driver was speeding because he wanted to get to Lagos as fast as possible to attend an afternoon soccer match. At about 2.30 in the afternoon, I was in Lagos Motor Park from where I took a taxi to Ikeja Airport of Lagos, Nigeria. At about 5 o'clock, I boarded a Pan-American aircraft that originated from Addis Ababa, Ethiopia to New, York's, to, to, to New York City, Chicago, and Portland, Oregon, United States, with stopovers in Monrovia, Liberia, and Dakar, Senegal. My longest journey was not from Nigeria to the United States, but was from the conventional supercomputer at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, to the massively parallel supercomputer in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. That journey was to the frontier of human knowledge that was at the crossroad of mathematics, physics, and computer science. I grew in scientific knowledge over the 16 years onward of March 25, 1974, that I studied mathematical physics and conducted supercomputer research and did both across six institutions and across as many national laboratories in the United States. As also expected, my parallel processing theories and companion experiments on what puts the super into the supercomputer grew and evolved over my first 16 years of research in the United States. In 1974, in Oregon, United States, I read a science fiction story that was published half a century earlier and dated February 1, 1922, to be exact. The science fiction was about 64,000 human computers working together to solve the partial differential equations that must be solved as the precondition to forecasting the weather for the Earth. After reading that science fiction story back in 1974, my quest became to figure out how to turn that science fiction to non-fiction. Back in the 1980s, my parallel processing experiment was like a warfare that I carried across a new internet that is a new global network of processors. I felt like I carried that warfare against 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists that mocked me and made fun of me and that dismissed my massively parallel supercomputer research as a blue sky project. Back in the 1980s, my research in massively parallel supercomputing was very advanced and too complicated and was impossible for anyone other than myself to understand. The reason was that it took me 16 years to understand how to parallel process and solve a grand challenge initial boundary value problem. For that reason, it would also take my readers 16 years to understand my original 1057-page research report. That body of knowledge at the frontiers of mathematics, physics, and computer science was not graspable within a few days. That body of knowledge on how to parallel process across millions of processors must also detain the reader for 16 years. I was asked to name who taught me how to harness the power of a new internet that is a new global network 
of 65,536 processors. By definition, the inventor was not taught the invention that he or she invented. As the inventor of practical parallel supercomputing, the community of 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists learned parallel supercomputing from me, just like I learned vector supercomputing from them. Back in the 1980s, I was teaching them practical parallel supercomputing instead of them teaching me vector supercomputing. To say that Philip M. Aguale, the inventor, was taught practical parallel supercomputing is like saying that a boy gave birth to himself and then created his own father. By the definition of invention, the inventor cannot learn what will make the next fastest computer fastest. By its definition, the world record fastest supercomputer can only be invented, not learned. Back in the 1970s, Jurai's parallel processing was attacked and ridiculed as a huge waste of everybody's time. The parallel supercomputer was mocked by Seymour Cray, the supercomputer designer that designed seven intense supercomputers of the 1980s. Massively parallel supercomputing across billions upon millions of processors represents the peak of supercomputer knowledge and demands an impeccable understanding of physics, algebra, and calculus. My primary goal when parallel processing across processors that define and outline an internet is to hit targets that we are invincible to other supercomputer scientists and do so by maintaining a one problem to one processor mapping. That mapping in turn is a precondition to actualizing the world's fastest computer. In the 1970s and 80s, my grand challenge was to figure out how to massively parallel process and to prove that the new knowledge of how to solve problems in parallel will become the vital technology that will underpin future computers and supercomputers. I was only interested in making the weightiest discovery that will upgrade parallel processing from science fiction to reality. It took me 16 years, onward of June 20, 1974, in Covalis, Oregon, United States, to discover practical parallel supercomputing. After those 16 years, the prize committee for the top prize in supercomputing invited me to San Francisco, California, for its annual, for its award ceremony and gave me the platform to present my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing and present it to the world at large and present it to the community of 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists that, that ridiculed and mocked parallel supercomputing as a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. Over the years, the finalist for the top prize in the field of supercomputing consisted of teams of up to 50 seasoned supercomputer scientists. I stood out because I was the only person that won that top prize and won it alone for my contributions to the development of the parallel supercomputer. If supercomputer scientists were ranked like the military, 
the inventor of the parallel supercomputer will be elevated to the rank of field marshal of the British Army or to the rank of five-star general of the US Army. Those are the highest ranks in the army that few, if any, are appointed to. Today, parallel supercomputing has become distilled and deciphered as a new contribution to a new computer science. The year 1989 was when the supercomputer industry understood and began to harness that new knowledge of massively parallel supercomputing and incorporate it as the vital technology that underpins every supercomputer. Back in the 1980s, the parallel supercomputer was like a giant ocean wave that many supercomputer scientists we are still riding, with most barely clinging onto the then radical technology and with some falling off it. Back in the 1980s, many supercomputer scientists mocked my discovery of practical parallel supercomputing and made fun of me. Today, Parallel processing is the vital technology that underpins every supercomputer that is used by those supercomputer scientists that mocked me and made fun of me. The parallel supercomputer of the 1980s was the most complex computing machinery in the world. That was the reason the community of 25,000 vector supercomputer scientists avoided programming the parallel supercomputer because it was too difficult to program an ensemble of 65,536 processors. I was the sole programmer of 16 massively parallel supercomputers of the 1980s. I was the only supercomputer scientist in the world that had the confidence and possessed the command of materials that was needed to parallel process across an ensemble of 64 binary thousand tightly coupled processors that shared nothing between each other. In the 1980s, I was the only supercomputer scientist in the world that had both the scientific and technological knowledge that was needed to deliver extensive public lectures on the parallel supercomputer. My extensive videotaped lectures on supercomputing can be watched on youtube.com slash I was at the ground zero of supercomputing. And that is the reason Philip Emanuel is the subject of school reports on inventors. Parallel processing is the greatest achievement in the world of supercomputers that resulted in the groundbreaking discovery that redefined the frontiers of knowledge in mathematics, physics, and computer science. I discovered parallel processing because my starting point was from first principles or the laws of physics. That's where I invented both new partial differential equations of calculus and their companion new partial difference equations of algebra. I was also the research code physicist that parallel processed 64 binary thousand computer codes and did so across a new internet that is a new global network of tightly coupled processors that were identical to each other and that encircled a globe and did so in the manner the internet encircled the earth. If I had followed the advice of Jean Amdahl or Seymour Cray, 
I would not have discovered that practical parallel processing will become the vital technology that will underpin every supercomputer of today. I invented practical parallel processing and I did so at a time the supercomputer textbook said that it will forever remain impossible or at least impractical. The forthcoming fusion of massively parallel processing with artificial intelligence will give birth to a new breed of fastest and smartest supercomputers. Such supercomputers can learn and detect and connect the dots amongst the important features in large data sets of seemingly unrelated facts. Such supercomputers can process and understand the realms of data and process them to discover new knowledge that would otherwise remain elusive. Today, robots are learning to think like humans. With supercomputing, humans will learn to think like robots, not vice versa. The supercomputer is used to increase productivity. Parallel processing inexorably exchanged the supercomputer and the technology is here to stay. I choose to parallel process in the 1970s and 80s and at a time it was forbidden by Amdahl's law as described in supercomputer textbooks that were published onwards of April 1967. My experiment of the 4th of July 1989 that I conducted across my ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors made the news headlines because it revealed never before recorded supercomputer speeds that I recorded by parallel processing across processors. I discovered that initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics that are impossible to solve on only one processor are possible to solve across millions upon millions of commodity of the shelf processors that we are within a massively parallel supercomputer. My discovery of practical parallel processing that occurred on the 4th of July 1989 in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States change the way we look at the computer and opened the door to further experiments on new computers that might be beyond the parallel supercomputer. Faster supercomputers contribute to the expansion of human knowledge. The reason I was the only full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputers of the 1980s was that the technology was mocked, abandoned as a dead-end road. Seymour Cray, the leader in the competing field of vector processing, vehemently argued that it would be a huge waste of everybody's time to pursue parallel processing. Seymour Cray and Jean Amdahl each believed that he would be dead before parallel processing becomes the technology that powers all supercomputers. On the contrary, Seymour Cray and Jean Amdahl both lived to see parallel processing become the crown jewel inside every supercomputer. My parallel processed solution of the grand challenge problem of supercomputing proved that both Seymour Cray and Jean Amdahl were wrong when they asserted that parallel processing is a waste of time. Back in the 1970s and 80s, to parallel process was to cross the border between the known vector supercomputer and the unknown ensemble of 64 binary thousand processors that was a supercomputer hopeful. The upper limit of my quest for the fastest computation 
was my parallel processed supercomputing in the 64th mathematical dimension in which two raised to power 64 processors that were identical to each other had a one-to-one -one correspondence with the vertices of the cube in the 64th dimensional hyperspace. That upper limit in parallel processing will remain in the realm of science fiction. The word computer had different meanings to each generation. To most people, the laptop is the computer. Back in the 1980s, the desktop was the computer. However, one thing that has not changed is the definition of the computer as a machinery that at its core executes fast calculations. The supercomputer is any one of the 1,000 fastest computers in the world. I'm often asked, what makes a supercomputer super? For me, the new supercomputer that I invented was a new global network of processors that had no central pro control processor. The new supercomputer that I invented is a new internet because it executes its calculations across a new global network of processors. The fastest parallel processed computations and communications could only be experimentally discovered on the cusp between the dream, the dream between the dream planetary sized supercomputer and tomorrow's science fiction internet. I was the subject of school reports because I discovered how to evenly divide real world grand challenge problems and discovered how to map those real world problems and how to distribute them with a one problem to one processor correspondence and how to simultaneously solve those problems across millions upon millions of commodity processors that we are identical to each other and that shared nothing between each other. I emailed each smaller problem as a digital code of zeros and ones. I divided each grand challenge problem according to a set of rules. I gave each emailed code a header that described which processor the code is from. That header also described which processor should receive the code and where the code belongs in the grand challenge problem that is an ensemble of millions of smaller computational physics problems that each is an initial boundary value problem that is governed by my system of partial differential equations of calculus. The new mathematical knowledge that I just described is the mathematical essence of the Philip Emma Aguale formula for the world's fastest computer that then US President Bill Clinton described in his White House speech of August 26, 2000 that made the news headlines. That new knowledge called practical parallel processing that I discovered on the 4th of July 1989 was what made the supercomputer super. The United States Constitution is amended occasionally to bring it up to 21st century reality. My supercomputer lectures must be similarly amended to bring them up to date. In particular, I had to enlarge what it means to smooth out the jagged frontiers of scientific knowledge and to contribute in the technological context of 21st century computer science. The quest for human progress is a journey to the future and to the terra incognita where the scientific discovery is the magical act 
of showing that sometimes that believed to be impossible is in fact possible to invent or see something that was previously unseen is to create the future it's like doing something no human had done before or like traveling to a planet no human had visited before I define the supercomputer as any computer that is listed within the top 1,000 fastest computers in the world. By my definition, the few computers of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s were supercomputers. And the computers that I programmed in the 1970s and 80s were supercomputers. Retrospectively, and as a sub-Saharan African-born scientist in the United States who came of age in the 1970s and 80s, my scientific career took a path that some thought it should not have taken. Back in 1989, many people struggled to understand why a black man was the sole full-time programmer of the most massively parallel supercomputer ever built. The answer, in part, is that I started programming the CDC 3300, one of the world's fastest supercomputers, back on June 20, 1974, at 1800 Southwest Campus Way, Corvallis, Oregon, United States. I remember that date as 18 days before President Richard Nixon was forced out of the White House. The maximum of 80 computer programmers at a time and from the entire state of Oregon indicated that there were only a few hundred computer programmers in Oregon in 1974. Back in the 1980s and within the nuclear research laboratories in the United States where active supercomputing research is conducted I was treated like a security threat. I was de facto an illegal alien who sought refuge at the frontier of supercomputing knowledge. For the record, my earlier supercomputer accounts were revoked whenever it was discovered that I was black and sub-Saharan African. Because my supercomputer accounts were revoked, my survival strategy was to stay low-key and, and do so during my first 16 years as a supercomputer scientist. As a black and African research supercomputer scientist in Corvallis, Oregon, my quintessential question was this. What did my isolating identity do to me as a research scientist? In Corvallis, Oregon, I lived a very isolating identity and I grappled with existential issues. After 16 years of unrecognized supercomputer research, I began to wonder if one day my contributions will be forgotten. Being the first person to be referred to as a supercomputer scientist confused a lot of people and did so in part because I was black and African. As a black parallel supercomputer scientist, I was mocked and made fun of because I walked alone and tried to turn this science fiction of parallel processing into the non-fiction that is today's supercomputer. Back in 1974, Kida Hall, the symbol of mathematics in Corvallis, Oregon, United States, was a seemingly majestic structure. So were the physics and the engineering buildings. Back in 1974, in Corvallis, Oregon, 
the computer science department was hinged in a hastily put together trailer. In 1974, I didn't see a future in the field of computer science because it lacked the respectability to be housed in a multi-story concrete building. In May and June 1974, I lived at 15 Edgewood, Edgewood Way, Covalis, Oregon, United States. That was the residence of Ted and Connie Falk. Falk. Ted was a chemical engineer that retrained as a physician, and Connie was a high school teacher. From March 1975, through June 1977, I parked my red two-speed bicycle at the back of Kida Hall at 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Cobalis, Oregon, that was 190 feet from the supercomputer that I was programming, that was the world's fastest computer when it was manufactured back in December 1965. From October 1975 through January 1976, I lived at 2540 Southwest Whiteside Drive, Covalis, Oregon, United States. That was the residence of Fred and Anne Merrifield. Fred was a noted civil engineer who co-founded a global engineering company called CH2M. I rode my red two-speed bicycle that I bought for $10 to 2000 Southwest Campus Way, Covalis, Oregon, a distance of 2.6 miles, where I used the teletype to assess and program the first supercomputer to be rated at 1 million instructions per second, and that was 190 feet away and across the street. The essence of my existence is abstract mathematics that is impenetrable to most research scientists. And solving grand challenge initial boundary value, mathematical problems, and solving them by massively parallel supercomputing their algebraic approximations was also impenetrable to the most able research mathematicians. Back in 1941, the largest system of equations of algebra that could be solved involved only 29 unknowns. The ENIAC and UNIVAC supercomputers came along in 1946 and 51, respectively. The CDC 3300 supercomputer that I programmed in Covalis, Oregon, was introduced in, 19, in December 1965, and in that year, it was the fastest computer in the world, or the number one ranked supercomputer. The CDC 3300 supercomputer was used to forecast the weather. The theorized parallel supercomputing that I invented in my head back in the 1970s was different from the practical parallel supercomputing that I invented later in the 1980s. Through two decades of trial and error, I learned that I could only invent the parallel supercomputer that could be invented, or rather the fastest supercomputer that the laws of physics permit me to invent. Prior to the 4th of July 1989, the parallel supercomputer was a technology that I knew but cannot explain or confirm by an experiment. I was the first person to be referred to as a supercomputer scientist. Supercomputing is a broad field. I am a supercomputer scientist that placed his emphasis on the science. Some supercomputer scientists are mathematicians 
who prove which abstract supercomputer can or cannot solve a grand challenge problem. Some supercomputer scientists are engineers who build supercomputers. Some supercomputer scientists are inventors who measure the speed of never before seen supercomputers and tries to invent the fastest supercomputer that is powered by new technologies. I was trained as a research mathematician, research engineer, and research physicist. I conducted my supercomputing research at the frontiers and at the crossroad where mathematics, physics, and computing met. In the 1980s, the United States Department of Energy compiled a list of 20 impossible to solve problems that were very important. Those 20 problems were thereafter dubbed the 20 grand challenges of supercomputing. Those 20 grand challenge problems we are to computing for the seven millennium problems we are to mathematics. The reason the grand challenge problems that pertain to physics were exceptionally difficult was that each problem can only be solved by a polymath who has command and mastery of physics, algebra, calculus, and computer science. My parallel processed solution of the grand challenge problem was highlighted in the June 20, 1990 issue of the Wall Street Journal and was described as cover stories of top mathematical publications. My complete solution was described in my very lengthy series of online lectures. Only a polymath will have the confidence to tackle the grand challenge problem. Back in the 1970s and 80s, extreme scale computational mathematicians didn't deem the parallel processing of initial boundary value problems of mathematical physics as merely difficult. Mathematicians deemed the parallel processing of real world grand challenge problems as impossible. For that reason, it was then said that parallel processing was a beautiful theory that lacked an experimental confirmation. My contribution to the development of the computer, of the supercomputer, is this. I provided that lockdown experimental confirmation of parallel supercomputing, and I made that discovery at 8.15 in the morning of the 4th of July, 1989, in Los Alamos, New Mexico, United States. I remember that date because it was the U.S. Independence Day. I discovered practical supercomputing and I discovered the supercomputer technology across my ensemble of 65,536 processors. That was the precursor to the current world record of 10.65 million processors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm finished, Emma Aguilar. Insightful and brilliant lecture. Insightful and brilliant lecture.